Samuel 24 we're going to look at tonight. As I said, we will finish our study in the book of 2 Samuel. And if you're taking note tonight, the title to the message is David's Best Day. David's Best Day. And maybe you're here and you read ahead and you're going, what is this crazy pastor talking about? David's Best Day. This is not a good day. This is a, David makes a mistake in the chapter. And there's discipline, there's consequence. Nevertheless, the title is David's Best Day. It's amazing how this, this book wraps up here in chapter 24 because it wraps up with David certainly making quite a mistake. So 2 Samuel 24, David's Best Day, if you're taking note. Before we dive in, let's set all our hearts. We're gonna pray. Uh, and I encourage you anytime, whether you're at home or if you're gathering around the word with your husband or wife or the family, pray. Pray, because obviously the enemy always wants to dive into those times and try to tarnish them. So Father, we pray tonight, Lord, as we gather as a church family, Lord, as brothers and sisters in Christ under our great high priest, our great chief shepherd, you, Jesus. God, we pray tonight, Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, give us insight into all that you have for us. And Lord, as we wrap up 2 Samuel, Lord, may we just hear your voice, Father, as we just finish this book in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it's amazing to me, David in the chapter before us, most scholars believe he's around 70 years old, possibly older at the time. But I believe David is still really just learning. And I believe in the chapter that's in before us tonight, here, 2 Samuel 24, I believe we're almost going to see David finally have that, that once in a lifetime, like, aha moment. We're going to see, it takes till 70 years old. This is a man after God's own heart. He's already failed many times. He's had many victories. But I believe in the chapter tonight, this is actually one of the greatest days that David will ever experience. I think if you and I get to heaven and we talk to David and you say, David, what is the biggest thing that ever happened in your life? What is the experience you remember more than anything else? I believe what we are going to look at tonight in chapter 24 very likely could could trump the David taking out Goliath and uh, the, the anointing that Samuel poured on his head as the, as the next king of Israel and so many other of these amazing events in David's life. I believe this chapter really uh, breaks the mold because I think David got it. You know, a lot of following the Lord and growing in your walk with the Lord, I believe it's like riding a bike. How many of you guys can remember learning how to ride a bike? Some of you guys are a little older. You're like, I think, I don't remember, you know. But, you know, learning to ride a bike, it's amazing. Following the Lord is like learning to ride a bike. You know, um, there comes a point where you just got to dive in, right? You remember, uh, you know, teaching your kids, uh, you know, my older kids know how to ride the bike. I'm going to have to do this again with Selah. My goodness, I'm going to need, I'm going to need, probably my wife will do it or one of my kids will teach her. But, uh, you know, it's amazing. I remember teaching them how to ride a bike. You got on there and they were struggling and they, you know, you got me? Yeah. You got me? Dad, you got me? Yeah, I got you. I got me, and I'm the dad that goes, I got you, and then I just pushed them, you know. And oh, they survived, you know. They survived it. They made it, you know. There's bumps, there's bruises, there's cuts, right? There's, there's leaps of faith, you know. But at some point, there's a breakthrough. You get your balance, and man, once you learn it, you can do it. You know, it's, it's one of those things you can't never forget. Now, following the Lord is very much like that, but I believe for many of us, you know, it takes a, quite some time to get our balance. And for David, I think he's grown and he's learned the Lord. But one thing that was so special about David, he was constantly learning. He was still growing. He, he, he made plenty of mistakes, but he repented of them. But I think in the chapter before us tonight, and I don't think it's any coincidence, it's the last chapter of 2 Samuel. I think there's just a breakthrough, a breakthrough in in David's life. So we're going to pick it up, 2 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. It says again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And it says here, he, if you have your pen, you could circle that word, he. We're going to come back to that in a moment, but it's very important. It says, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Now, number one, if you're taking note in terms of David's best day, kind of just gleanings here from this chapter, number one is you need to learn how to discern the difference. Discern the difference. 
You know, one of the reasons why we need to study our Bibles is, you know, because we have to discern the difference. We have to learn the difference between what's from the Lord, right? What's from the enemy? We have to learn the difference. Uh, those that are for us, those that may be against us, right? That maybe don't have good intentions for us. We have to learn how to discern the difference. And here in chapter 24, it says the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And the reason why is David is actually going to be moved to, to count or take a census of the children of Israel. Now, what's very interesting here in chapter 24 is that word he. Um, if you have a King James Version Bible, you'll notice in your Bible, the word he is actually lowercase. But if you have the Calvary Chapel sanctioned New King James Version, unfortunately, the translators blew it here, big, okay? And they capitalized this word, word he, which it really shouldn't be capitalized. It should be lowercase h. Now, this same account, uh, and as we study through chapter 24, we're going to see this kind of over and over again. The same account is found in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1. And in Chronicles, the Holy Spirit, and the best commentary for the Bible is always the Bible. In Chronicles, it tells us that it was actually Satan who prompted David to take this census. Now, you see why the translators did a bad job here. Because Satan doesn't get any capital H's, number one. Number two, they're insinuated that God was the one that did this. And it's just not really accurate. Uh, even, uh, you know, for you Bible students, some of you probably know this, some of you don't. You know, in the Hebrew, there's no capitalization. It doesn't work like that. So we only get the capitalization in the translation to, to that English Bible. But it's, it should not be a capital H here. You see, it was the enemy here who is going to prompt David to do this thing. And, and the enemy often will do this. He will prompt us to do something that will try to get us to the place where we can do this apart from God. See, that's the motivation behind David counting the people. It's self, right? It's pride. It's the idea to see how strong we are now as a nation. And David is being prompted by the enemy to do something that would cause him to feel like, now I can do this apart from God's help. Guys, listen, the Holy Spirit will never point us in that direction. Never. You know, the Holy Spirit is actually trying to, the more we mature in our walk with the Lord, get us to the place where we're actually more dependent on God. There's never a point where God wants us to get to the place where we're like, Lord, thank you for all you've done. I really appreciate it. I got the rest from here. You know, that's not the Lord doing that. He's not making us more self-sufficient apart from him. Does he want us to be responsible? Yes, of course he does. Does he want us to be industrious? Of course he does. You know, I believe God wants us to, to take what he's given us and do the best we possibly can for him, not just sit around and, you know, twiddle our thumbs. He wants us to be active in our walk with the Lord, whether it be in sharing the gospel, praying for people, serving the Lord in the body of Christ, learning God through the word of God. We should be active in these things. We should be assertive, I might even say, in some of these things. But he doesn't want us to get to the place where we're doing in our own strength. But Satan here prompts David to count the people. And David is going to make a, a, a mistake here. He's going, to, he's going to respond to it. Look what happens. Let's move on. Verse 2, it says, So the king said to Joab, remember Joab here, the commander of the army who was with him, it says, now go throughout all the tribes of Israel. So David is telling Joab, he says, go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people that I may know the number of the people. Verse three, and Joab said to the king, now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are. And may the eyes of my Lord, the king see it. If you have your pen, underline this, but why does my Lord, the king desire this thing? Listen, whenever someone like Joab is the one who's setting you straight biblically, you know you're in trouble, man. I mean, how many people have we seen Joab just flat out murder? But Joab even knows this is not what God wants. It's number two, if you're taking note in terms of David's best day, and you might be going, this doesn't sound like the best day David could have ever had. You'll see. You'll see as the chapter unfolds. Number two is you need to let God lead. You really do. We got to let God lead. 
You know, I do think we need to be ambitious. We need to be assertive. We need to be proactive in our walk with the Lord. You know, we need to be praying for people. But, but in the midst of that, there is a way to do that and still let the Holy Spirit lead. You know, it's kind of part of the discipleship process, you know, whether it be physically, you know, a man or a woman with another man or another woman, discipling and encouraging and mentoring, or whether it be how God does it with us. You know, it all starts off with parenting. You know, the beginning of a spiritual discipleship process is parenting, really. You know, you're, you're at the beginning, somebody gets saved, you're teaching them, this is what's right, this is what's wrong. It's spiritual parenting. You know, you know no, don't touch that. No, no, don't put your hand on the stove. It'll burn you, right? You don't want to do that anymore. There's a reason why the Bible calls it sin. It's not going to benefit you. Spiritual parenting. But then as you move on, now it becomes more spiritual mentoring. There's, there's, they're, they're starting to get the, the, you know, not to do the foolish things. And now you're beginning to teach them the wise that they become wise. But then at the end of it, it turns into partnership. Now you're doing things together. You're doing it. You're, you're walking alongside of you in these things. They're beginning to be able to be used to the Lord as well. It's exciting. It really is. It's such a natural process. And it's exactly how our walk with the Lord is. It's exactly. At the beginning, he just flat out says, no, don't do that. You know, you need, to, you need me. But then he begins this process. Listen, we have to let God lead. And it's amazing to me that this many years into David's walk with the Lord, this many years as leading the nation of Israel, all that David's gone through, he still has so much to learn. He still has so much to learn. Guys, we would be wise to realize no matter who we are, how long we've walked with the Lord tonight, we still have so much to learn. There is no place that is more dangerous than when a believer gets to the point where they just become familiar with the things of God. It's such a dangerous thing. You know, I grew up in uh, South Florida, and uh, I didn't live right around the corner from Disney World, but I didn't live that far, you know. We lived about three hours from Disney World, and, you know, I remember, you know, I can't remember the first time I went to Disney World, but I can remember the first time I remember going to Disney World. Boy, man, it was amazing. You're going to Disney World, seeing Mickey Mouse, real Mickey Mouse? You know, you didn't know when you were a little kid that he was a stuffed animal, you know. You're like, oh my gosh, Mickey Mouse. I remember going to Space Mountain. I thought I was on uh, the biggest roller coaster that ever existed in humanity, you know. My little heart beating. But man, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, twentieth, and some of, the, some of the kids are pretty jealous here. You know, some of the adults are like, I've never been. <laughs> Don't worry. But the 50th time I went there, and I've probably been there that many times, I was like, oh, there's Disney World. Now we're here. Great. You know, there's Disney World. Yeah, well, there's Thunder Mountain. Great. Yeah, you, know. you know, it's amazing. You get familiar. It is, I was familiar with it. You know, you, you see other people come in, they're like 60-year-old adults, and they're like, oh, and they start acting weird. You're going, what's wrong with you? You know, and kind of our walk with the Lord, you know, a new person gets saved, and you're like, oh, this is Jesus. You're like, yeah, it's Jesus. Uh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, it's a church. They teach the Bible. I've been looking at churches my whole life. You're like, yeah, they teach the Bible. I've been here a long time now. Yeah, verse by verse. You'd be surprised how long it takes, you know, <laughs> But do you understand? We get so familiar. But I remember I got to take my kids to Disney World a couple years ago. I rem now Disney World changed. Because I came, I brought somebody with me, right? And I saw them experience it. And then I was like, wow, this is great, right? You know, that's what can happen in our walk with the Lord. And for David here, he started to get too familiar. You know, the God of the Bible who had taken down Goliath, David started to, the God of the Bible who forgave him for his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, he started to get too familiar with this. Yeah, God forgives anything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy, does it have consequences. You know, we need to be careful of this. We need to be careful of this. And David, he fell prey to this. We're all so vulnerable to this. I believe the body of Christ today is so vulnerable to familiarity with Jesus. And we're going we're gonna to die or we're going to experience the rapture of the church. We're going to see him. And I'll tell you, in that very moment, we're not going to be familiar. We're going to be whoom, on our faces. The glory of God. I think we need to pray about this. Say, Lord, keep us from getting too familiar with you. It's one thing to know him, but it's another thing to just start to take him for granted. We don't want that. I know I don't. We don't want that as a church. And certainly living in a world, in a region where so many people are living apart from Christ and the Lord's uh, great plan to save them is choosing us, which is crazy to me, but it is his plan. 
we should not be getting, you know, complacent and familiar. We should be saying, Lord, keep me fired up for you, right? And David, though, did this. So if David fell complacent to this, so can we. Let's move on. Verse four it says, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab was trying to talk sense into King David, which, as I said before, is just crazy. And against the captains of the army, therefore Joab and the captains of the army, look at this, went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. Verse five, and they crossed over the Jordan and camped in Aurora on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad and toward Jazer. Verse six, then they came to Gilead into the land of Tatim Hodshi. They came to Dan John and around to Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and to the Canaanites. Then they went out to, uh, out to South Judah. So there was <laughs> South Judah, right? As far as Beersheba, that's where they talk with a, you know, an accent and things like this. And uh, verse eight, so when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem. Look at this, if you have your pen, underline it. At the end of nine months in 20 days, Verse nine, then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. Now, this is very interesting. A couple things here. You know, it, it tells us here, where we can't go through the whole geography of Israel, but basically Joab and these valiant men transverse, you know, all of Israel. You know, they go to Israel north and then Judah in the south, and they move through this whole, this whole region systematically, but it says it took them nine months and 20 days. Now listen, I hope and pray that before Jesus returns, uh, you know, I can lead a trip to Israel here with the church. I mean, it's life-changing. It's so wonderful. And uh, it changes so much about even your study of the Bible. But I can tell you this from being there, it does not take nine months and 20 days to get through Israel. You know, I picture Joab here just going so slow. He probably had the worst attitude ever, you know. He's going, the king told me to count the people. I am the most unspiritual person ever walked the face of the earth. And I know this is wrong. You know, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What's wrong with David? But he comes back and he tells him here, look at this. You know, all these men, you know, 1,300,000 soldiers. I mean, you see why David wanted to count them. Israel had grown so strong. But it's amazing because as we move through this chapter, you're going to see God, even in disciplining David in the nation, is going to show him why the numbers have nothing to do with it. You know, if you're taking note, jot it down. It's Psalm 20, verse 7. This was a Psalm of David. This is when David said, some trust in horses and some in chariots. But remember what he said? He said, but I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. David, as he, quote unquote, matured, he forgot these things. He forgot the God who gave him all the victories. And now he was beginning to rest on the fact, well, you know, I got 1,300,000 soldiers. I dare the Egyptians to come after me, right? Or the Assyrians. Come see me with my 1,300,000 soldiers. You know, it's a dangerous place to be. Even Joab knew it wasn't right. And you'll see here from the response of God that it certainly wasn't right. Let's move on, verse 10. It says, and David's heart condemned him. Wow, if you have your pen underlined that there, David's heart condemned him. Now, con condemnation is not from the Lord, church, it's not. But David was beginning to experience that, that what he had done, he realized it was wrong. You know, he had nine months here in 20 days where I imagine as Joab and these, these men were traveling through Israel, the Holy Spirit was speaking to David's heart. You know, that is, the, that is the hard part of even being a pastor is fundamentally when someone is caught in a sin or finally the Holy Spirit brings it to light, you know what I know, what I know? What I know is this, if that person is genuinely a child of God, and usually you could tell based on their, their life, and you know the Holy Spirit's been talking to them the whole time. You know how I know that? Because the Holy Spirit does the same thing to me when I do things wrong. He's going, you know, every morning, devotion. You know, the reason why most people navigate from reading their Bible and praying, you know why? Because they want to do some sort of sin. 
And they get tired of hearing the Holy Spirit tell them over and over again that they shouldn't do it. You know, that's usually how it works. And you know, that's the reason why it's so important we stay in the word, right? And that's, it's almost like a doctor, you know, comes and checks up, you know, oh, I'm really struggling. Are you reading your Bible and praying? Are you going to church, gathering? I was, well, I was, uh, you know, had the flu. I was watching the Animal Planet, you know, and was watching this special on Yosemite. And they, uh, the wolves had died out in Yosemite many years ago, but they actually reintroduced wolves into Yosemite. Now, it kind of sounds crazy, right? Like, why would anyone, wolves are all dead. Let's have a party and say thank you and let's move on. But they, they reintroduce these wolves and, and they're showing these wolves and all these people from all around the world come there and they watch these wolves. They got these cameras. It's amazing. And uh, they were showing how the wolves, it's always the same. The wolves hunt the same way the lions hunt in Africa. They would wait for the elk or whatever to just navigate away from the pack. And guess what happens? That's the one the wolf takes down. And these, these elk or these other, these other they're, they're so much bigger than the wolves. Together, they're, they cannot, the wolves won't even attempt it. But when they're all by themselves, they just gather in a pack mentality and they take them down. It's what happens, guys. It's what the enemy wants. And the Bible says here in verse 10, after those nine months and 20 days, the Holy Spirit's been working on David. Finally, Joab comes back and he tells him the number. Verse 10, David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, he said, Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, this is a good thing. You know, it's, uh, this is a sign of maturity that David does the wrong thing. It shouldn't have taken him so long to repent. But when he repents, he goes right to it. I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O oh Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant. Meaning, guys, listen, for your note takers, jot this down. Sin is the act of sin, right? Sin is the act of it. Iniquity is the, is the ripple effect in the lake of sin, right? So sin is the act. Sin is dropping the, the rock in the water. Iniquity is how it spreads through our community and our families, you know, we have a very small understanding, so little, such a small understanding of the impact we have on the people around us. I mean, I don't, if you never tell anyone about Jesus, if you are the most lukewarm Christian that has ever walked the face of planet Earth, you still have the presence of Jesus Christ inside of you. You have, a, you have a, an effect on the community. Just our presence in this region preserves the community. Just our presence. When the rapture happens, man, all hell is going to break loose because God's out of here. How is God present? He's present in the lives of his people. We're all, the Bible tells us, like these arcs of the covenant walking around. You know, you go into shop, right? You think you're just going to get some, some groceries. No, man. The ark of the covenant is walking in the shop, right? Some of you guys are like, I like this. I'm going to get a t-shirt. I am the ark of the covenant. You know, that'll be a good conversation starter, you know? The Jewish people will be like, you? I don't think so. <laughs> you know? be like, where's your prayer shawl? Where's the hat? You know, where's the curls? I just got my hair cut. I don't have curls. You know, you don't. But, you know, that, that's truly what we are. Whether we realize it or not, even if we're walking in the Spirit and singing worship songs or not, the presence of God is inside of us. David kind of forgot this. But now as he repents, he gets it. He says, Lord, forgive me of this sin. And Lord, please take away the iniquity. You know, we need to pray that. We have to realize this. To pray this. It's not to be condemned. You know, there's a big difference between condemnation and conviction. The Bible in the New Testament goes out of its way to make sure we know condemnation is not a motivation that God uses. And you know how you know the difference between when somebody's being condemned and convicted? They both hurt, like, bad, right? We don't like either of them. You know, we would have preferred to go, oh, God, I wish I would have never done this. But conviction drives us to Jesus. Condemnation drives us away from the Lord. I always know when somebody's suffering with condemnation because they drive away from the Lord. Oh, God can't love me anymore. You bet he can. He loved David. He loves you. He cares about us. It should drive us to the Lord. And that's what David says here. He says, take away the iniquity of your servant, verse 10, for I have done very foolishly. And that's true. It's the truth. Listen, this is still David's best day. You're going, I'm not seeing this. Number three, if you're taking note, David's best day, number three, is you need to be drawn to Jesus. 
We need to be drawn to Jesus. Listen, when you are doing well and reading your Bible and praying and abstaining from sin and just staying in fellowship, be drawn to Jesus. But listen, if and when you stumble and fall, if your attitude isn't right, if you start to walk in the flesh, in the Holy Spirit over the nine months and however long it took David here, nine months and 20 days is convicting, you finally respond to it, don't run from Jesus. Be drawn to Jesus. Be drawn to him. Go to him. Listen, like Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have through Christ Jesus. We need to go to him. You cannot allow the enemy to condemn you. You just can't allow it. Here at Calvary Chapel, we try to go out of our way to, to share with you your identity in Christ, who you are in Christ, what God has done on our behalf. Listen, none of us are going to go to heaven because we deserve it. Not one of us. Billy Graham didn't go to heaven because he deserved it. Pastor Chuck didn't go to heaven because he deserved it. It's the blood of Jesus. And we all stand the same. And, and David here goes to the Lord and he understands this. And he's not condemned. Verse 11, look at this. It says, now, when David arose in the morning, he couldn't sleep, guys. When things aren't right in our walk with the Lord, everything is off, Right? He couldn't even sleep. He rises early in the morning. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer. You see, David's heart was so off, God couldn't speak directly to David. So he had to send a prophet to him until David could get his heart right again. Verse 12, he says, go and tell David, thus says the Lord. <laughs> oh man, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. Now listen, this is probably not a conversation any of us ever want to be in with God. He says, here's the deal. You've sinned. I'm going to bring discipline. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a choice. You know, you go, you know, he gives them three choices, A, B, and C. You go, I'll take D, none of the above, right? It doesn't work with the Lord. He gets that. You know, he goes, no, no. One of this is what's going to happen. This is where David is at, guys. You know, David wasn't feeling well. He knew he had sinned. His heart was off. That's the consequence of sin, of not responding to the Holy Spirit. Our hearts can get off. You know, I think about it like a sponge. You know, you can have a, a sponge that could be filthy, dirty. But then you could take that sponge, you could bring it under the water, you could turn the water on, let it rinse, and just keep letting it be filled and squeezed out. Filled and squeezed out. You see, when our hearts get off with the Lord, that's what he has to do in our lives. He has to fill us, squeeze us out. Fill us, squeeze us out. You know what that squeezing out of the hands of God is called? That's called discipline. We go, Lord, I just want you to forgive me and I don't want any discipline because of your love. And he goes, uh, that wouldn't be loving. Do you know how dirty you are, man? Disgusting. You know, I love you too much. Come here, son. Right? And we go, ah! And you go, no, no, this is good, man. You know, if your sponge could talk, when you squeezed it out in the sink, it'd be, ah, it's so painful, I can't do it, right? This is the Lord, though. He's squeezing us out. It's on purpose. He needs our hearts to get right because you know why? He doesn't want to have to send the prophet Gad so we can hear. He wants us to be able to hear again. But he's got he's to cleanse us. He's got to work in us, church. And that's what he does here with David. And the beautiful thing about David, on a side note, is that David... It may take him a while to hear from the Lord or get himself right here. We see it took him nine months, over nine months. But when he finally hears, he lets the process play out God's way. And do you know that's all that God really needs from us? It really is. It's the big picture. I mean, obviously, we want to learn to obey God a little sooner and hear the Holy Spirit respond. But at the end of the day, if, if we never let him just squeeze us out and do what he needs to do, he ends up just having to put us on the shelf. We don't want that. So God says, I'm going to give you three choices. Verse 13, look at these. So Gad, so Gad, not God, Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, so here's the first choice. Number one, you, you know, shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? So David's like, okay, all right, there's one choice. Number two, or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Now, David's thinking, I've done this before. I know what this is. I'm picturing David right now crossing this one off the list going, no, no, I know I'm not going to pick number two. Or number three, shall there be three days plague in your land? Now, consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me to God. 
Verse 14, and David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Yeah, I bet you are. This is like a picture of a parent with their child. The kid got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He's about to get disciplined. The dad puts him on his knee and says, all right, here we go, Sonny. I give you a choice between three. You know, you can either one, right, get a whooping. Number two, you got a, you know, two weeks grounding. Or number three, you know, you got to shovel all the driveways of snow in the entire neighborhood. Right? It's like, what do we do? And they're in great distress. That's where David is. That's where we are at times, guys. We're in great distress, but the Lord's still in charge. Please, he says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord. For his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of men. Can I tell you something? Ding, ding, ding. Right answer, right? That is the way to go. You want to learn from, from the Bible? Learn this from David. When you did something wrong and the Holy Spirit is saying, there's going to be consequences, this is what you do. Lord, I trust you. Whatever you think is best, it's almost like cheating. It really is. God says, oh, you get it. Now, God noticed here, because he doesn't raise pampered children, there's still, he doesn't go, wow, that was a great answer. Come on, let's go to dinner. We're not going to do anything, right? No, 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 there's still consequence. But man, it does move the heart of God. It certainly does. It certainly does. He says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord. And we need to have hearts like that towards the Lord. Verse 15, it says, so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel. So that's the one that God chooses. The third option here. From the morning to the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, look at this, 70,000 men of the people died. There's still consequence. And when the angel, look at this, stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who is destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Look at this. Now, a couple of things, if you're taking note to jot down there, apparently in this time of discipline, David has a keen insight into the spiritual realm. He actually, the Bible tells us here, sees this angel of the Lord with his sword drawn, wiping out these people. I believe there's purpose in this. You know, what had happened in David? What was his mistake? His mistake was he began to think his strength was in the numbers of his military. God now has David seeing, even during his time of discipline, he's teaching David something. There's purpose in it. You see, discipline from God is always about direction. It's not just meaningless. There's purpose behind it. And he's showing David, David, one angel, one angel with his sword drawn wiped out 70,000 of your valiant men. It was nothing. You see, there was a time in David's life where he knew this. David had lost this. He had put too much trust in the arm of man and the strength of man. Can I say this today, church? We need to remember this. We need to remember this as God's people. You know, God has done so much in our lives individually, in our families. And he's restored so much. He's blessed so much. I mean, I know so many of you and what God has done, how he's restored you. You're in the midst of restoration. He's doing the work. And the great fear is this. I believe from the heart of our God, it's like what we see here with David, is that we would get to the place where he's blessed us and rather than our early on, our hands were so open, we were just blessing and giving and just free in these things and now all of a sudden, we start to possess the things of this world, right? And God's looking on going, I'm the one that gave you everything, right? Your brain didn't even work before you met me, you know? I did this, now let me keep doing it. For David here, he started to trust in man. He's the one that wrote the verse. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. See, we need to continue to trust in the Lord. You know, how did David forget this? What happened? What happened? But see, David now, in the midst of all this, you see at the end of these verses here in verse 
17, he says, I have sinned. And he says, but these sheep, what have they done? See, David begins to pray for them. David, even here in the midst of his discipline, begins to pray with the heart of Jesus, of the Savior. Remember Jesus on the cross? He said, Father, forgive these sheep, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. That's the heart of God. You know, even if a brother, a sister, a friend, a neighbor, somebody we know and love gets caught in a sin, you know, we have to deal with it biblically, and I'll tell you this, God will deal with it, but we still have to maintain, we, we have to protect our hearts, right? We have to say, Lord, forgive them, right? Lord, work in them. Lord, show mercy to them, right, as you have with me. And David begins to do that. And let's move on, verse 18. It says, And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Verse 19, so David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Verse 20, now Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arana said, why has my Lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now, number four, if you're taking note, we're almost done here in terms of David's best day. And listen, this is when David's day starts to change. You see, he's going through the discipline. He's going through the discipline. He's obeying the Lord. He's fallen on God's mercy. He's saying, Lord, whatever you have for me. And then the prophet comes to him and says, all right, God came to me and told me to tell you to build an altar. In David's mind, he knows an altar means it's finished. It's over. Number four, if you're taking note, David's best day is stay at the altar. See, the only way, child of God, listen, the only way we lose, the only way we get off, the only way the enemy starts to manipulate us and in so doing, Work, work in our minds to get us to defeat ourselves is if we leave the altar. That's it. You see, for David, he had to wait for the prophet to come and tell him, build an altar. I'm telling you, when David heard the prophet say, now it's time to build an altar, David knew, oh, thank God, it's over. You know, the grounding is over. The, the spanking is over. Whatever it is, the discipline is over. When God says build an altar, David knows it means a couple things. It means blood, it means sacrifice, and it means atonement. The word atonement means at one minute. See, understand, for David and the children of Israel, for even Gad, they understood what it was to go to an altar. A man would take an animal, a lamb, they would bring it to the temple, and the priest would inspect the lamb, right? The priest wouldn't inspect the man, but inspect the lamb. See, David understood this. You know, just by simply showing up and coming to the altar, you know it was what is insinuating? It was insinuating that you were a sinner. Publicly, people knew. Oh man, this guy. My goodness. If I had a quarter for every time he went to the altar, you know, be a multimillionaire. It's like this, where does he even get these sheep from? He's probably stealing them, bringing them, asking the Lord to forgive them, killing, you know. I mean, it is, but just by going. You know, there's probably many going, yeah, I went to the altar a couple years ago. That's all I needed. You know, <laughs> the Lord's going, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> should have went to the altar, you know. It's not true. You see, we all need the altar. That's the big secret. That's why Pharisees don't work. Because <laughs> you're not that fair, you see. You need Jesus. When David heard about this, he knew what it meant. He knew it would be a sacrifice. And he knew that the lamb would be killed, but it would be a sacrifice and it would be over. And the wrath of God, the wrath of God would be removed. See, this is the big thing that the church today is missing when we don't teach people the full counsel of God in the gospel. You see, this is the gospel. The gospel is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The, the, the gospel is that we're all sinners in deserving of God's wrath of God's wrath. You know, we've sinned. We've sinned against a holy God. He gave us commandments. We said we're good people. He said, okay, then follow them. And we have not followed them. You know, the Bible says that there's a generation that says they have been cleansed and they have not been cleansed. We live in that generation. 
We live in a generation that thinks they are so righteous and so holy. And I'm telling you, we live in the most unholy generation maybe ever. And yet everybody's going to heaven, right? We're all Christian. No, it doesn't work like that. Because in order for God to be good and God to be loving, God has to be just, right? We understand this. If, if an animal, if a rabid dog came into my house with foam coming out of their mouth and was ready to attack my children, I wouldn't be a good father if I said, you know what? Not a big deal. I love animals. Go ahead. I would be a sick father. Something would be wrong with me. If I took that dog and I broke its neck, I would be a good father. And we have to realize this. God, our God is a good father. He doesn't watch 200 million plus babies aborted. All that's happened in this world, the oppression, drug abuse, right? Molestation, all the stuff that's happening in this world around us as we sit here tonight. He's not gonna look at that and, and not do anything about it. You see, the Bible says the wrath of God rests on man right now. But see, that's what the gospel is. What happened with David was David heard the altar and he knew about the grace of God. See, the, the grace of God, the gospel, is that for God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus. Jesus was the lamb and he died in our place. And when we believe on him, guess what? The wrath of God no longer about, is over us. We're no longer under the wrath of God. We've now, we're children of God. We've been set free. David understood this. <laughs> and Aaron, uh, you know, if you read in Chronicles, apparently Aaron, uh, this man, also saw the angel, you know, and he sees it. Now, David comes to him and says, I need the, your threshing floor. I want to buy it from you. Aaron, uh, seeing this angel with the sword drawn, killing 70,000 men, Aaron uh, says, there, take it. Whatever it needs to happen to get this plague off of Israel, I'm on board. Take it, take it, take it, right? And I love David's response, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Now, Verse 22, now Aaron said to David, let my Lord, the king, take and offer up whatever seems good to him. He's like, please just get this giant angel from killing everybody. Look here, our oxen for burnt sacrifice. He doesn't say just, here's my, he doesn't say here's my land. He says, here, take my oxen, right? But for burnt sacrifice, threshing implements, the yokes, the oxen, for what? He's like, whatever you need, you have it. You take it. Just get this angel out of here, David. I don't know what you did. Verse 23, all these, O king, Aaron, <coughs> Aaron has given to the king. And Aaron said to, to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. You know this man Aaron is special. You can hear it in his voice. Because he, he doesn't just say, David, you stupid idiot king, you know. Look what you've done to us. Just get, do whatever. He speaks to David, understanding that David has obviously done something wrong. I mean, it's pretty hard to miss that. Right, you know, that's the funny thing about sin. People are like, I think nobody knows. Everybody goes, of course I know. What are you kidding me? It's so obvious. Look, it's like there's like a boulder standing on top of your head right now. You know, we see, we know. But, but the Aaron does deal with it with grace and they understand, you know, I'm a man just like you. And may the, you know, he says, may the Lord your God accept you. Verse 24, then the king said to Aaron, look at this. He says, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. If you have your pen, you might want to underline this. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord by God with that which costs me nothing. You want to know what makes David David? It's not that he was sinless. It was this. This is the stuff that made David David. He says, I'm not going to offer the Lord something that costs me nothing. You know, I don't know how I would have responded. I says, wow, this is, I might have said, well, this is really the Lord. You know, it's, it's great. not only am I going to be able to sacrifice and get the judgment office, it's not going to cost me a penny. Aaron, the Lord is going to bless you, right? You know, you can almost see yourself going through it. But David says, no, I'm not going to offer the Lord something that doesn't cost me something. You know, that's what worship is. Worship costs us something. Our lives, to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. It's part of the danger of some of the messages we're hearing in Christendom today. You could follow Jesus, you could still be close to God, and it will cost you nothing. It's not what happens. It's not true. I'm not saying, listen, what it has cost me to follow Jesus, I have been paid back times a million. It's not a fair bargain here. But did it cost? Yes, it will cost you something. There will be people that you will love in Jesus' name. That you'll be, they'll be cursing in your face going, what is going on right now? 
And it costs, that costs you something. But you, you know, this is what it is to follow Jesus. If they did it to the master, what do you think they're going to do to the servants? You know, Jesus came to serve and to love and this is, you know, and, and to treat them too good. It's part of it. But David says, I'm not going to offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the auction for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord, look at this, heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. It's number five if you're taking note and we'll wrap up here. David's best day. And obviously this is where it happens. Number five is give God your best. Give God your best. This is a secret of following Jesus. It really is. I want you to imagine for a moment, you invite Jesus to your home for dinner. You invite him over and he says, yes. Now Jesus is coming to your house for dinner. As Jesus comes in, you open the door. You're like, oh my gosh, honey, it's Jesus. He's there. He comes into the house. Do you go over to the fridge, pull out some Tupperware, be like, how many days ago, honey, did we make this? You know, <laughs> was this two or three days ago? I think you'll like this. You know, it's a little old, but, and then you take it out, you pop it in the microwave, you be like, dinner will be ready shortly. <laughs> like really, none of us would do that. Hopefully, right? We wouldn't though, we wouldn't do that. We would make him the greatest meal we know how to make. And we would want it to be fresh and hot and ready and prepared and him to sit there. This is, this is the heart of David. This is the heart of David. Though he has sinned, though he's made mistakes, though it took nine months for the Holy Spirit to finally break through to him. What are you doing? When he broke through, he says, no, I'm not going to give God something that costs me nothing. You know, in 1 Chronicles, and I encourage you to read that, you know, chapter 21, chapter 21, verse 26, it tells us that when David built the altar and offered the burnt offerings, that fire actually came from heaven and consumed that altar. You know, and I think something happened in David's mind that moment, in his heart. It was a transition. You see, he realized something. This is the sacrifice that God desires, a broken and contrite heart. That's it. That's what God wants. Something that costs us something, brokenness, he doesn't just, you know, God's desire isn't to be like, I just love just whooping my kid until he gets it. That's not the heart of God. What he wants is brokenness and contrition in our hearts. Saying, Lord, this is an act of worship. It costs me something. I am sorry. Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, this, this is difficult. There are challenges within me and without me. <laughs> But Lord, I want to follow you, Jesus, and I offer this to you as an act of worship, Lord. Whatever it is, we do it. And I'm telling you, the fire will come from heaven and consume that sacrifice. And when that happens, that you never, all of a sudden, you, real, you get your balance and you start riding the bike. And you never forget, you know, and I've said this to you guys many times, usually not Wednesdays, but usually Saturdays moving into Sunday, I usually pray this prayer, and I read this many years from a pastor. He said he would pray that for all the people, because he, he would remember when he didn't yet know that no matter what he had done, or the, wherever his heart had been, he remembered when he didn't know that he could just go right back to Jesus and that there was a sacrifice in the altar and he could be completely forgiven and just walk with the Lord freely. And he would pray that for the people, that they would come to know that. And, and I, I just want you to know, I pray that for you guys. I pray that, that we would get to that place. And I believe that is when the bicycle all of a sudden starts to make sense. And we're trying so hard to learn how to ride. We're doing our best. We're reading our Bibles. We're praying. We're trying so hard. And then all of a sudden one day, oh my gosh, I got it, you know. And then all of a sudden, this great difficulty turns into, I'm riding my bike, you know, and a beautiful day out is easy. It's a leisurely activity. And that's, that's what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. By grace through faith, we have been saved, not of works. David was a man after God's own heart, and this is what it looks like. Amen?